two weeks ago, we looked at 1 Peter chapter 3, where we were reminded in, in that scripture uh, to always be prepared to give an answer, a reason, a defense. The Greek word is apologia, for the hope that we have within us, the hope of Jesus Christ. And so we talked about four uh, elements to that, the providential uh, who, the personal why, the biblical when, and the polite how. Last Sunday we looked at a passage of scripture in the book of Acts where we concentrated on how the pivotal when happens. And we looked at that uh, story between Peter and Cornelius and how the Holy Spirit just orchestrated a meeting between them where Peter was able to uh, share the gospel with Cornelius, and not just Cornelius, but his relatives and his friends. In fact, Cornelius' house was just packed out as Peter uh, showed up for that divine appointment. And you know, the Holy Spirit orchestrates, sets up those pivotal whens, those divine appointments in our lives as well. And, uh, and so that then underscores the, uh, the kind of command that Peter gives us to always be prepared. Because those pivotal winds for believers are going to come. And the Holy Spirit is always at work around us. Well, this morning I want us to think about the personal why. The telling of our story as we witness to the, to the faith. And we're going to look at a scene from John chapter 9. We're going to look at a blind man who is given sight by Jesus and then tells his story. And there are going to be some things that are a part of his personal why that are takeaways for you and I uh, and our personal story. So from John chapter 9, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. So he's healed at this point. Jesus has healed him of his blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said this man is, meaning Jesus, is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. So they have a little argument going among you between themselves of, about the nature of Jesus. They then turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. So you got the pivotal wind. The man replied, he is a prophet. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind to give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man, again meaning Jesus, is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know, but one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you do not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, again, being Jesus, we don't even know where he comes from. Man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they turned him through him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when Jesus found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man 
man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Well, we're going to look at this as, as a case study for, for sharing the story. Sharing the story. But before we do that, I want to take just a moment and share something that I have, have shared before on a Sunday morning. And, and that is that a lot of times when you and I think about witnessing, and I'll just be really honest, one of the reasons that a lot of Christians don't witness is because we are operating out of an erroneous model of what witnessing is all about. One of the erroneous models of witnessing is to view witnessing as being a salesman. And so in that little shaded box in your worship bulletin this morning, if you think witnessing is being a salesman, then if you think sharing your faith is being on a sales call, and your mission is to close the deal, we learned last week that's not true, it's the Holy Spirit's job, and you show up and you download dogma because Jesus is now a product, and the main thing you're going to talk about is the afterlife, and it is an event. If that is the model of witnessing for you, if you think that's what witnessing is about, no wonder so few Christians do it. And it doesn't work that way. Now, everything's important. Everything is possible with God, so I'm not saying it can't work, but what we find in the Bible, that when those share their story, they're not salespeople on a call looking to close a deal. They're people that have a story, have an experience with Christ that just naturally flows out of them as the Spirit has set up a pivotal. And so perhaps a better way to think about witnessing is not to see ourselves as a salesman or saleswoman, but to see ourselves as a travel guide. And I'm borrowing this from a wonderful book called Reimagining Evangelism by Rick Richardson, where we see ourselves on a journey. And what we're doing is we're inviting other people to join us on this journey. And we're not on a sales call. We're not a salesman trying to close a deal. We're, we're trying to be a mentor and a guide folks to join us on this wonderful journey. And we're not downloading dogma. We're telling our story. We're telling our story. We're telling people about the Jesus we know and the Jesus we have experienced. And yes, there is discussion of afterlife, but it is broader than that. It's about kingdom life. It's about the reality of God in the present, not just in the life to come. And this isn't a singular event, but it's a, it's a process of which we invite people. Us. Now, if we begin to think of witnessing in, in that kind of a paradigm, which is healthier and more holistic, then perhaps this idea of sharing your faith won't be as much of a barrier as, as some people think it can be. Now, I want to come to John chapter, chapter 9. There are four things that we can learn from this blind man that now can see about the sharing of our story. If we begin with this about the blind man, he has a true and you know, that's really where everybody's story begins. He has a true need. His need in this particular case is obviously physical blindness, but he's getting far more than just a physical healing here as we see Jesus moving deeper and deeper into this man's life. And in fact, I would suggest to you that in John chapter 9, we've we got a lot of blindness going. There's a, a lot of spiritual blindness being demonstrated by some folk in, in John chapter 9. But he has a, he has a true need. James McDonald in his, in his book, Vertical Church, called folks who recognize that they have a need, he calls them red apples. And the reason he uses that term is he's playing off the statement that Jesus made to his disciples that the fields are ripe unto harvest, talking about them going out and, and bearing witness uh, to, the, to the gospel. And that when you and I recognize that we have a need that only Christ can fill, that's a red apple season and moment in our lives. That's when you and I become open, really open, to the gospel and to the person 
into the, the deity that was and is Jesus Christ. And you know, Jesus recognized this throughout his earthly ministry because there were people that surrounded Jesus that thought they were well and they weren't. Who thought they had life all together and they didn't. And that's why Jesus, for example, makes uh, the statement that uh, those who are well or who think themselves well uh, have no need of a physician. In other words, if you don't think you have a need, then it's going to be very difficult to be open to seeing the need for Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Jesus says elsewhere, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And when you think about Jesus' earthly ministry, uh, he was always surrounded by people, but many times he would pass the crowd by because there was a red apple. So he's, he's going through a village, and he sees a red apple named Zacchaeus up in a tree. And, you know, he, he pretty much dismisses all the green apples that have surrounded him because there's the red apple, there's somebody who's just ripe, whose life filled with stuff is so empty that he says to the red apple, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, I want you to come down out of the tree and I'm going to go have dinner with you. I'm going to spend some time with you. There's another moment where Jesus is surrounded by the mass of people and there's the woman with the issue of blood. And he stops. He stops. Because that's a red apple. And he ministers to her. Meanwhile, the masses are coming and going all, all around him. Jesus stopped for a centurion whose daughter needed healing. Jesus stopped and spent time with Nicodemus and discussed uh, his spiritual life because he was mired in a dead religiosity. All of these are people whose lives were empty. They knew it, and they were willing and open to receive the one who could fill it. Our stories always begin with our need. With that moment in life when we realize no matter how many relationships we have, no matter how many friendships we have, regardless of how many likes we have on our Facebook page, regardless of how much money we earn, regardless of the stuff we have packed in our garage, there is an emptiness within us that all of that can never fill, can never make us complete, can never make us whole. And so out of that need, out of that recognition, we embrace the one who can. And so the first part of the blind man's story here is he had a true need that only Jesus could meet. And for believers, that's true of all of us. We don't have to be physically blind to have a need that only Jesus can meet. All of us have a red apple season that Jesus stepped into. Second thing that we notice about this uh, blind man's story is not only did it begin with a true need, but because of that, then he has a transformative experience. He has a transformative experience. Uh, Jesus not only heals him uh, physically, Jesus then moves into the inner part of this man's life and begins to heal him and make him whole spiritually as well. But he has this transformative experience growing out of that true need they had. The third thing that this man has is he has a theological explanation. You know, at some point in the hearing of our story, the personal why has to be about the providential who. Now, what I really want us to think about with this man here in John chapter 9 is notice throughout this passage how his understanding of Jesus continues to grow. And so when he is first asked about Jesus, he says Jesus is a prophet. That's in verse 17. And then a, later, a little later he's asked about Jesus, and he says, well, Jesus is godly. Jesus is, is from God. That's in verse 30. And then ultimately at the end of the passage, as he and Jesus continue to have dialogue, 
he says that Jesus is his Lord. And so throughout this passage, his knowledge, his understanding, his experience of Jesus is continuing to grow. Now here's what I want us to have as, as a takeaway from this element of theological explanation. Because I have heard this, been a pastor for 31 years, I've heard this many, many times. One of the barriers to people witnessing, to believers witnessing, is this. Well, I'm always afraid they'll ask me a question I can't answer. Well, I'm afraid they'll ask me something about the Bible that I don't know. Let me tell you this. If you think that before you can witness, you need to know every single thing there is to know about Scripture or every single thing there is to know about Jesus, you will never utter a single word of witness to anyone at any time. Ever. There are people, some of you will come into the church office, typically it's not to see me, you're really coming to see the office assistant. And, uh, but you'll, you'll go in there and you'll, you'll, you'll do your thing and then people will come into my office and they'll kind of pop in and they'll, they'll say, Nelson, you know, I was reading in the Bible the other day or I heard on the radio or some friend of mine said such and such to me and, and they'll ask me some biblical question or theological question or whatever, which is great. And, and I just want to say to you right now, half the time, you know what I have to say? I don't know. But let me think about it and do a little research on it and I will get back to you. I'm saying to you, with 31 years of being a pastor, I don't know everything there is to know about the Bible. And if anybody ever tells you that they do know their, everything there is to know about the Bible, they will lie to you about other things. Keep that in mind. What I love about this man in John chapter 9 is he says repeatedly, well, let me tell you what I do know. Let me tell you what I do know. Yeah. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. Let me tell you about the experience I had. Let me tell you about the need He met in my life. And that is the core of the personal why. It's not knowing all the answers to everybody's questions. It's not knowing everything there is to know about the Bible. It's not having some grand systematic theology or Christology about Jesus. It is simply sharing what Jesus has done in your life and saying to folks, this is what I know. And I love that about the, the blind man you can now see in John chapter 9. You know, because there he is, surrounded by these Pharisees who are steeped in all this tradition and all this schooling and, and all this kind of religious knowledge, and he just looks at him and he says, this is what I know. This is what happened to me. This is the experience I had. That's the, the core of the personal why. And I would suggest to you that's what people are really interested in in hearing from us is how is Jesus Christ real in our lives? What has our experience been? What need, what emptiness has Jesus met and filled in our lives? So we have the true need, we have the transformative experience, we have then the theological explanation, the personal why intersects with the, with the providential who. And then for me, the blind man in John chapter 9 is, is a tremendous example. You know, sometimes when we think about witnessing, in the back of our mind is always this haunting question, well, what will they say? What will people think? How will they react? Well, my goodness, if you look at John chapter 9, talk about a hostile witnessing environment. Here it is. Here it is. I mean, this poor blind man uh, who can now see, I mean, everything about him and, and, and his experience is, is discredited by this group that has surrounded him. So they, they try to discredit him. And one of the things that we didn't look at in John chapter 9, but which is there, is, you know what they said? They said, well, surely this is not the same guy we've been seeing in the village blind for years. This, this, this is somebody else impersonating 
uh, go get go get his parents. Let's bring the parents in, and, and we'll 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 you know we'll bring out this guy's true identity. So the first thing they do is they discredit him. Well, mom and dad show up and they say, no, 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 this is, this is our son. Same guy that you've been seeing blind for years here in the village. So then they try to discredit his experience. And that didn't work. And then they try to discredit Jesus. And that's not working. I mean, talk about a hostile witnessing environment. Here it is, but yet this man just continues to say, let me tell you what I know. Let me tell you what my experience is. Let me tell you about the need that was met by a man named Jesus. What, a, what an awesome example for us. I don't know how many of you play chess. I do not. I, 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 I know how to play it, but I don't play it on, on any regular basis. But the American Grand Master is a guy by the name of Wesley Sue, S-O-O. -O. And he grew up in the Philippines. And he did not grow up in a very good home life, grew up in, in a fairly impoverished uh, situation, but he first played chess when he was about five or six years old. And at the age of 16, he leaves home. He leaves home. And he attends a little American school there in the Philippines. And while he is at this school, he meets an American couple uh, that happened to be their, the company that the man worked for just happened to be, uh, had sent him there temporarily to work in the Philippines. So he meets this American couple, and they, they kind of learning of his background and, and you know, had no home life. And they kind of take him in. They take Wesley Sue in. And a couple years later, they returned back to the United States. But this, this relationship, this bond had really developed. And so they encouraged him, now he's 18, to come to the United States and to enroll in college, to further his education. They just see potential and they see just a bright, intelligent mind. And, and so he does. And so he comes to Minnesota, which is where they live. And, uh, and they take him in, and he lives with them while he's going to college. Meanwhile, they're encouraging him to continue on with his playing of chess, because this was just a, a real passion and application of his. This is a deeply committed Christian couple. And Wesley tells the story that when he came to live with them in, in Minnesota, he saw them doing things that he hadn't really picked up on in any way back in the Philippines. For example, they went to church every Sunday, and so he went to church. They prayed at meals, and so he would pray with them at meals. And he saw a love and a peace and a serenity and a contentedness in them that he knew he did not have and that chess could not fill and that a college degree could not fill and that friendships could not fill. And so he learned that the secret of their joy was Jesus Christ. And so there came a moment when he said, you know, I prayed with them at the dinner table, but then I started praying on my own. There came a moment when the only time he didn't open the Bible was when he went to church on Sunday morning, but now he opened up the Bible every day. And they mentored him, and they guided him, and they discipled him. And he is, he is an amazing Christian today as a result of their witness, of their sharing their story about what Jesus had meant to them and what Jesus had done in their life. Now, I set all of that up for this. He is right number two in the world in chess. Number two in the world. And when he talks about grand masters in chess, he says it's a very small universe. It's a very small universe. And when he shares his faith story, which he does on a regular basis, both in person and via his social media platforms. He says all of those folks in that little small universe of chess grandmasters, he gets a lot of ridicule. 
as he said, the problem with chess grandmasters is they think they're the most intelligent people on the planet. And they think because they're so super intelligent that any kind of faith is for the weak mind. But Wesley Sue has made an inroad into that small universe, not by being a salesman on a sales call trying to close a deal and dump it dog on but by saying, let me tell you what Jesus Christ did in my life and what my experience has been and my words, my personal why as an intersection with the providential. And so this morning, I want you to think about your personal faith story. 